presentation of the season. I'm not nervous, but I know she is. <laughs> now, now we got it up, I'm good. Okay. She's, she's, her heart rate's coming down now. Uh, had a little projection issues uh, leading up to this. Um, anyway, uh, I just wanted to announce the new season. Mary Ann couldn't be here. She's the president, and I'm the vice president, and we got the secretary, secretary treasurer, treasurer uh, right over here for Prince William Sound Audubon. Um, what I wanted to tell you is the upcoming lecture series that we have, the presentations we have lined up so far. Uh, in October, we have Chris Rainey, and he's going to give a presentation on a, a visit to Easter Island, uh, and that's October 22nd. On uh, November 19th, Aaron Bowman will be our speaker, and he's going to talk about the effects of the 2011 uh, Japanese tsunami on Black Brant and how they've adapted to the changed landscape. And then December 10th, uh, Aaron Bowman and or I will do some sort of review of some group of birds to prep people for the upcoming Christmas bird count. And Bill Lindo, will you be here for this year's Christmas bird count? I, I intend to be. All right. Yeah. Uh, anyway, December 14th, I think that's the first day in the window. It is the first day, the 14th, that the, that the count can take place. Uh, we'll have the Christmas bird count and put that on your calendars, December 14th. Um, with that, we always try to start off with interesting bird sightings. So other than vast numbers of sandhill cranes, has anybody seen uh, any cool birds lately? I the ospreys around. Yeah? Out of the Alleghenics. Yeah, here in town, somewhere here yeah. and then up the road. Yeah. Well, a couple of merlins out of the Alleghenics. Uh-huh. A couple days ago. Not that unusual at yeah. all. Uh, how in the sound, how the fishing here in the last few weeks, I've seen a few uh, sooty shearwaters, which you don't always see in Orca Bay. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're having trouble. There's die-offs in certain areas, and I wonder if they're stressed and coming into places they don't normally come. And some ancient murrelets uh, I saw also. Mm -hmm. Pete, you gotta have something? No, no, no there were so cranes moving through at Boswell Bay a few days ago. There's one newcomer to town that no one's recognized yet. In the back of the room, we have our new district ranger that probably most of you don't know yet. Uh, Steve Hammett uh, comes from Oregon. And uh, anyway, uh, you guys can introduce yourselves or Steve to, the, to this group uh, when you get the chance. And I will say, you're a rare visit from a district ranger to Tuesday Night Talk. So I'm, anyway, I'm thanks, uh, thanks for coming. Yeah. I also wanted to mention the ash trees out here, which the berries are pretty much gone now, but this week we had some really good sightings um, here at the office. Oh, right. We had an immature, immature cedar waxwing. We had a female pine grosbeak. Um, there were buried thrushes in there, and I think somebody spotted a female western tanager right. as well. Yeah, yeah. They, they cleaned up those berries really good. <laughs> yeah, they moved on. It's been but quiet this morning. There's mountain ash down at the hospital that still has berries, plenty of berries down that way. So these sheer waters are probably a oh. hundred or more out in you know, between Green Island and Night Island last wow. week. Okay, you were on the off lake. Oh. Yeah, and lots of oyster catchers too. Lots of yeah. oyster catchers. Cool. And murelets and mirrors and uh, um, or winter plumage auklets. Ancient? No, Mark, not the or ancient, the regular. Um, crested? The crest, uh, no. no, the other, the... Parakeet? Parakeet? Whiskered. could probably tell us about whiskered on this. So the ancient murders, is that weird to find in this site yet? They're just uncommon. They're around all the time. We, we saw one in sheep. Yeah. Sheep yeah. Uh, a few days ago. Oh, I was surprised to see it. But yeah. Yeah. Wasn't sure if it was unusual. Well, we'll save Hamish's. Hamish has just been out the Aleutians for the whole summer okay. in a sailboat. <laughs> and, and Kate. And uh, anyway, they will. I'm sure we'd love to have you report on that uh, at some point. Yeah. And there was a Sabine skull that uh, oh. Bill and photographed. Yeah, right out here in Orca Inlet, a Sabine skull. Bill? Um, yeah, it just kind of seemed to me that the cranes were traveling late this year or continued on beyond. They, they were a little later than normal. They usually peak here the 14th of September yeah, and peak yeah, no. after the 17th. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just kind of curious if that's... The well, they do a crane count in Homer on the 24th of August, so they all hung around for that. <laughs> <laughs> another one about a week later, another one a week after that. So it might have been 
Yeah, I think I texted you in late August when I saw a couple by the airport, yeah. and they're still coming through. Yeah. Uh, yeah, pretty interesting. I'm seeing a lot of small raptors too, Cooper right. hawks. I mean, shubshins and uh -huh. uh, small. So with that, Kate McLaughlin will give a presentation on her hummingbird work that she does right here in Cordova, the banding and maybe something on the returns and that sort of thing. Well, actually, what I'm going to talk about today, first of all, thank you for coming to my talk tonight. I'm actually glad it rained because otherwise half of you wouldn't be here. Um, so this is a talk that I just recently gave down in Sedona, Arizona for the Sedona Hummingbird Festival. And what, I'm, what I'd like to highlight in this talk is how we make a marriage between uh, citizen science, bird watchers, bird lovers, and researchers, and how, especially with hummingbirds, those two things come together and create success and a whole lot of new information that we wouldn't otherwise come up with, and this is the wrong thing. So, um, I'm going to use two species of hummingbirds that I work with to illustrate this point. Wait, which one is advanced? To the right. Did you put the thumb drive in it? I did. Not in that. It goes in your computer. Duh. <laughs> I knew that. I was just saying you were paying attention. Okay, there we go. All right, so first off, we have to ask the question, why do we ban birds, right? Well, first off, first question, answer is we don't really know things without having a bird in our hands. We can't tell how what exactly is it? I mean, we might guess it's something, but until we see it in our hand and look at specific characteristics, we don't know for sure. We sure as heck don't know where they're going, how many return year after year, how long do they live, and how are populations changing over time, which is the key to research, is long-term records over time. So then we have to ask, well, okay, we're putting these bands on birds, but how successful is it? Well less than 1% of birds that are banded are actually recovered away from their uh, original banding area, which makes it super, super valuable for every single recovery that we get. Birds, recoveries of birds that I've banded here on the breeding grounds are pretty common, actually. It's birds that are banded elsewhere <coughs> that are caught far from their original banding spot that are the real gems that can really give you valuable information. However, both pieces of information give us specific um, tools to look at. Uh, so birds captured here that I might catch as a baby one year and then I catch them as an adult subsequent years here at the same place, they tell us a lot about population trends. How um, site fidelity, how well do they love this place that they're going to come back to year after year. Uh, and how successful is, is breeding from year to year as well. So where are these rare species hummingbird banders? Well, there's only about 120 master class hummingbird banders uh, in the United States. I am one of them. I'm one of three that uh, work in Alaska. We have, between us all, we have about 150 subpermitted banders underneath us. Banding started out in the southeastern United States. That's where most of our banders are, are on the east coast. We're starting to build a really strong cadre in the southwest. We've gotten a handful now in Canada and British Columbia, and then the three of us up here in Alaska. So that brings us to how did this all begin, and what did we learn from them? I should, I should uh, look at my notes so I'm not forgetting things. Okay. So one of the first people, our, our great goddess of hummingbird banding, is Nancy Newfield. She established a very strong network of hummingbird banders in the southeast United States, and she started off just as a bird watcher. She loved hummingbirds, she loved birds in general, and she started noticing a lot of birds that weren't supposed to be there, and so she'd report these birds and they'd poo poo her and send her on her way, and she's like, no, I know what I'm talking about. I'm seeing birds that are not supposed to be here. So she is the kind of person who's very tenacious, very stubborn, and also very smart. She decided, I'm gonna prove it to you. So she went and she got herself uh, uh, trained and certified as a hummingbird bander, and she started catching uh, thousands of birds that weren't supposed to be here. And she has documented over 11 species of hummingbirds in the southeast United States. And she has a cadre of, of banders now throughout Texas, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, etc. Um, 
that are to this day still making wonderful um, research discoveries. So it brings you to me. I'm the Alaska Hummingbird Project. I am a scientific and educational 501c3 nonprofit as of 2015, getting ready to celebrate my fourth year as a nonprofit. I've been studying hummingbirds, however, since 2007. I do most of my work here in Prince William Sound. I started off in the native village of Chiniga Bay, which is on the western side of the Sound, um, studying predominantly this guy, the Rufus Hummingbird. This is a species of international concern. It is the farthest northern breeding hummingbird in the world. This is the extreme northern edge of their breeding population. We know a lot about them as far as physiology and flight dynamics. Without studying hummingbirds and bumblebees, we would not have drone technology today. However, we don't really know a whole lot about their life history and their just general breeding and migratory behavior. So local recaptures, birds that I've banded and recaught on the same site in subsequent years, can tell us a lot. Oop, where did that go? What happened there? Come on, give me my, there we go. Okay. I didn't like my lead-ins here. So we can learn about baseline population, recruitment, site fidelity, longevity, and trends over time from year to year. So. I've banded quite a few birds since 2007. This year, I got to break 3,000. Yay. So that's just birds banded. So it doesn't count my recaptures. Okay. So um, just looking at these numbers in general, uh, we can you can see, oops, let's go backwards. Go back one. You don't look at that yet. No, we're not there yet. <laughs> So I started out in 2007. I actually began the season late, so I didn't catch any <coughs> adult males at all. It was just females and the hatch young of the year. And then we had years like snow apocalypse year here in, um, what, 2012? That had a really depressed bloom because of all the, the snow that we had. Um, we had a, I don't know, who doesn't know about snow apocalypse in this room? Everybody knows about snow apocalypse? Okay. Be Beats is looking at me like, what? So we had a huge yeah. snow dump that winter. It was so bad, so much heavy, wet snow hit. It was so good. The Prince Snow. <laughs> it was so good. They had to send the Army National Guard to communities like Cordova to shovel people's roofs because things were collapsing. Wow. There was so much yeah. snow. I, s I shoveled, like, in my driveway, it was about 50 feet. I, had, I shoveled, like, three or four four big piles that were over six feet. Exactly. I was like walking up, I was living in Chenega at the time, and I was walking up a snow drift to stand, step onto my roof to shovel. Yeah, so that, so you can see the difference in numbers there. It, um, they're really um, very, very influenced by spring bloom, and bug, and snow levels. Okay, so then I moved to Cordova and 2015 and 2016 was my first year banding here, so just a few, few birds. But as you can see, how it builds as we get over, and, and the recaptures will really show that. What so, was going on with the odd years when you're in Shaniga? What do you mean the odd years? They are a little bit higher numbers, which is you know, coincidentally, pink salmon, of course, have even odd. <laughs> I know, <laughs> so you know. I'm going to stick this guy on your data. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You want to do some statistical analysis? I I'm just eyeballing. <laughs> <laughs> this one is a little bit more interesting. Let's look at this in a graphical manner. So one of the questions comes up to my mind when I look at this is, why do we have so many adult females as compared? Well, one of the things we can point out right away is let's look at hummingbird life histories. So the males show up on the territory end of April, right at the beginning of May. The females usually show up a week to 10 days later. They'll get down to nesting at the peak bloom. So sometimes you might have a little lull between the time that they arrive and when they really start initiating nesting. Sometimes we've got a bloom that starts off right as when they're arriving, like they did this year, and they immediately start nesting. And if there's a lot of bug and bloom going on, they're not gonna show up on your feeders anyways. They're there, they're just like, their groceries are too good for you to come to your syrup, really. Right? So the males then pull out and they're gone by the end of June. And the females and the babies of the year start showing up on the, fem on the feeders again by the beginning of July. So I've got three months to catch females and babies. I've got two months to catch males. That's why there's such a significant difference between adult males and adult females. Okay. 
So here's just some, uh, a look at some of my numbers with recaptures here. And one of the things that you'll note is my average local recap percentage is 18.2%, which is phenomenally high for mark and recapture pro um, projects. Most mark and recapture projects um, if you're talking about something like Craig Madkin working on his orcas, you know, he's getting his, a whale when he can, and he's, and he's lucky if he can and get that whale tag back again. Or say, uh, in the fall, I go down to, uh, or the end of summer, I go down to Arizona to do banding down in Sedona, and we're catching birds that are on the migratory route. So they all have really good site fidelity and they will come back through the same routes from year to year. However, there's a lot more variability on the migratory route. So what do we have going on in the south? We've got fires, we've got droughts, we've got habitat destruction. So any and all of those things and things that we don't even understand yet could affect where those birds are going at any point in time. So the, the ability to recapture a bird from year to year is significantly less than recapturing a bird on its breeding ground. So that's why my, my uh, recapture percentage rate is so high, is 18.2, and that percentage will just grow as we look at our data over years. If we just look at one single year, we say, oh, well, that, that's my snapshot in time. It's not really gonna give you the data to really understand exactly what's going on. You have to look at it over years. So increase over year shows the importance of long-term project observations. And I'm starting to build that data now in, in Cordova here. Okay. So foreign band recoveries. Birds captured carrying bands placed on at another site. These are the real gems. This to shows us migration patterns and timing, location of breeding and wintering grounds, what environmental conditions might be influencing, and more information. Every question that we seem to, to come up with just generates even more questions after it. So here's the Rufus Hummingbird range map from the 1990s. This was done by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And common knowledge was Rufuses are a Western species, period, the end, mm -hmm. done. I'm not gonna talk about it anymore. Boy, were they wrong. So, my very first foreign recapture, so work like Nan what Nancy Neufeld was doing was proving that was wrong, and then my very first foreign recapture for sure put the nail in the coffin that rufuses are only western species. This bird I was banded in January 2010 in Tallahassee, Florida, and I recaught her in 2010 in Chenega Bay. This was the long distance mm -hmm. recapture for any hummingbird to be caught on both sides of its migration. That was a line of, uh, if we do a straight line from Tallahassee to Chenega, that's 3,500 miles. I doubt she flew in a straight line. But we're still <laughs> trying to figure out exactly what path she did take. So my second foreign recapture that we had, this bird was captured as a hatch year in Fort Davis Mountains, Texas, which is right on the border. And uh, that was in August 27 on, in 2012. That's a really important date. August, late August. I recaptured her in Chiniga uh, the following summer, 2013, more than likely she was born there. She did it again in 2014. I caught her again. She was like, oh really, is it you again, really? <laughs> um, but here's something interesting that these dates tell us. So who remembers when the babies show up on the feeders? Early Thank you, Pete. <laughs> So if she was born in July, early July, and she flew all the way to Texas, mm. this bird, so you're talking about a bird that's like a month old, flew in three weeks, weighing barely four grams, all the way to Texas. That's pretty darn amazing. Mm. And she did it at least twice that we know of. So now, We've got this thing called eBird. Too bad Aaron's not here, this is our local eBird expert. So everybody familiar with eBird? Anybody's not familiar with eBird? eBird has shown us amazing data. This, this is all the Rufus Hummingbird um, maps, uh, all the data that was put into that online computer database, and now I see all these little dots? These are all winter Rufuses, and a good many of these dots are by hummingbird observers both banders and people who have hummingbird feeders. So you can see how the range map has 
totally been reshaped in, in 10 years. And most of this is citizen observation data. There are some very small spots like in Minnesota, Minnesota yep. there, Illinois, Wisconsin. Yeah, that's crazy. As a matter of fact, yeah. I just got notice from our hummingbird listserv that an immature Rufus hummingbird was banded in Lafayette, Paris, Louisiana on January 8th this year, and she was just recaptured in central Kentucky. That's not there, or is it? Well, this, this, oh. this map I put up before, this was just, she just did this, this week. So, so much for Rufus is only being a Western species and only wintering in Mexico. Sorry, Vitsa. <laughs> okay, so I had only two foreign recoveries birds that I had banded in Alaska be recovered outside. Uh, and the first one was a bird I banded in Chinega as an adult female in 2014. She was found in Steamboat Springs, Colorado uh, later that, that year in August. Unfortunately, both these birds were found um, deceased, but what, how amazing is A, they found this little tiny green and white bird, right? And they thought to go show it to somebody and that somebody noticed that there was a little band on this leg and they reported it because this is where the gold is. Um, second bird was banded in Chinega as an adult in 2009. She had been recaught in subsequent years in 2013 and 2014. That made that bird at least eight years old because she was banded as an adult. Once they're an adult, I can't tell how old of an adult they are. Um, so she was one of my oldest record females and she was found in Mill Valley, California in 2015. So what does that tell us? Well, here's some trajectories of those birds. So here is um, my first farm recovery. And then here's the two deceased birds, and then here's the bird that um, went to Texas and back. So seems like they're all over the place, isn't it? So the question, some of the questions that arise from this are, well, what is the migratory route that they're taking? Um, could, could it be, you know, we, we've been seeing birds um, showing up in weird places up here and along the coast in the dead of winter. Could it be that maybe we've got some birds that are traveling up through this way? Or are they coming down the coast and then dispersing across this way? Another thing that um, we're thinking about is that perhaps we have two different populations of rufous hummingbirds that are breeding in Alaska. So Gwen Ballas uh, works for the Far Service. She bands down here in Tongass. Uh, a few years back, she was working with a PhD student who was doing isotope studies. Uh, so isotope studies are really cool. You can take a fingernail, a feather, a hair, and analyze it for a pollution signature. And this pollution signature is unique to a specific region of the world. Now they can't like take it right down to a pinpoint, you know, this particular mile marker on the highway. But they can say it came from this part of Alaska or this part of California. So the birds, um, she took I think six or eight feather samples and sent the, uh, of females that she had been capturing in, in Tongass, who were breeding there in Tongass, and sent them down to be analyzed, and those birds were coming out of Mexico. So their pollution signatures were coming from down here. So it's very possible that the birds that are breeding up here are going here, and the birds that are breeding here are going down here. And the only thing that's gonna answer that question is more detailed isotope studies and more recoveries of banded birds. What elements were you looking at? I wasn't doing the analysis, so I can't answer that question. So that brings us to another species of hummingbird that I am now doing work with, and that's the Anna's hummingbirds. Has anybody seen a fall or winter Anna's in Cordova? Yep, they're here. So when was we started seeing, um, getting reports of these, Bill? It was like 2002 we started getting reports of birds overwintering in Cordova, somewhere around in there, right? Probably before that, because I think Venus would have had some observations on Christmas bird count. Right, before exactly. So this bird is a pretty amazing species. So here, on one hand, we have the Rufus hummingbird who's declining across its range. Uh, it's having a problem all over the place. And now we're looking at the Anna's hummingbird, which traditionally was not found farther north than Baja, California in the 1940s. 
um, and now uh, has been doing this rapid range expansion. This is a western species, uh, and there was a study done in 20, uh, the study encompasses 1999 through 2010. It was published in 2018 or 2017. Uh, and this guy was looking at uh, bird feeder data, hummingbird feeder data, uh, and through Project Feeder Watch and some other um, supplementary feeding information he was getting. And he pretty much thinks that, well, the anus are expanding because there's more hummingbird feeders out there. Hmm. I'm not so sure I'd buy that. For one thing, we know if we leave the feeders up, those, the birds are going to migrate when they're going to migrate. It doesn't matter if we've got feed, and whether it's seed feeders or hummingbird feeders, the birds migrate when they're going to migrate, right? They're not going to stay. And we're seeing, we've seen these anecdotal evidences of annas here, overwintering here, and other areas in South Central. There's not hummingbird feeders up, but they're here. They're being sighted. So... These guys from the 1940s were in California, Baja, California. Uh, they started wintering into Arizona. By the 60s, they were into Texas, Northern California, Oregon, Washington. By the 70s, they were breeding in Arizona, moving into Nevada, Colorado, New Mexico, British Columbia, and Alaska. When did we start seeing them here? November 1971 was the first sighting record in South Central Alaska by Pete Iceland and Solf on their big bird count that they did back there in the 71. Uh, and in 1971, they were considered accidental into Alaska. 1991, they made the first Christmas bird count. This past bird count, Christmas bird count, we got two birds. I don't remember, but we're getting them just about every year now. Yeah, it's like guaranteed. You know, Go hang, hang out at the Weeses or Losies, or <laughs> you're going you're gonna to see an Anna's. And this brings up a whole other question about Anna's life history that is completely crazy. So, 10 more individuals were recorded in Cordova, Anchorage, Girdwood, and Palmer. These two pictures were birds that were shown in Seward. This guy is really interesting. This is a mature male, and he was photographed in May. Now, when are we seeing the Annas? Are we seeing them in the summertime? I'm not. I'm not seeing them on the feeders. Uh, we start seeing them now. I got my first uh, couple of, um, uh, of um, sightings. Uh, one was in Homer two weeks ago out in Port Graham, and I got confirmed photographs of that, and then uh, the Weeses, the Annas, are showing up on their, on their feeders over there at Six Mile. So where the heck are they in the summer? They gotta be here. I mean, we've got a picture of this adult male right here in May in Seward. And then, um, was it this spring? Uh, Aaron saw that male displaying out there by the hospital at Odiac Pond. So they gotta be here, but for some reason they're not showing up on the feeders, whether it's because rufuses are too aggressive and, and they just don't wanna mess with the rufuses or, or whatever, we're not seeing them. So, we can't say definitively, are they breeding here or are they still just kind of like wandering into town in the fall? All right, so we're trying to figure that out. So we've had all these sightings, but no one actually captured one until October 21st, 2016, just right around the corner at the top of Lake Avenue where I was renting a house, I caught these two guys. So this was October. We had just had our first snow of the year. Uh, and my son was out there playing in the snow, and he comes in and he says, Mom, I just heard a hummingbird. I was like, no. I said, no, I did. I was like, let's hang up a feeder. So we did, and then the weather went crazy, and we had to wait a week, and we were watching this female coming into the feeder. So we were all set, ready to go, catch this female. It was a beautiful day, trap set, ready to go, about ready to drop the net, and this guy zooms in, chases her off, and I said, okay, I'll catch you instead. <laughs> So I did. This is an immature male. His head is not fully covered in, in, in these wonderful iridescent fuchsia colored feathers. And this is a mature female. Now, unfortunately, I'm not permitted, nor do I have the expertise to take a blood sample on one of these birds. That would be really nerve wracking, can you imagine? Mm -hmm. um, to see, is this mama and her son? We can assume that it probably is but no guarantee. So I banded those two guys, and they were the first banding records of Anna's in South Central Alaska. 
And then in 2018, we did it again, but this time I was out at my main Rufus banding site, Diane Weiss's out at Six Mile EF Drive. And again, we caught, thank you Milo for these wonderful photos, an immature male and an adult female. So that was number three to four Annas to ever be banded in South Central Alaska. What dates were those roughly? That was uh, November 2018. So as of 2019, approximately 22 Annas have been banded in Alaska now. Uh, Gwen has ba banded at least 14 down in, in Tongas. And then we have a brand new bander, Tom uh, Esklin, just received his Master Hummingbird Banding Permit. He's a longtime passerine bander, works for Fish and Wildlife out of Kenai. Or no, not Fish and Wildlife, Park Service. No, he's, uh, he's, he's Fish and Wildlife? The Refuge, yeah, okay. Fish and Wildlife. Okay. So he's just, he just jumped right in. He was going to town. He, he caught uh, a bunch of birds last year in Homer, Kenai, Soldatna. So what does the range map really look like for Anna's? We're still trying to figure that out. And are they breeding here? And the only way I'm going to be able to answer that question is A, we find a nest, which wouldn't that be fun, <laughs> or B, I catch an immature bird closer in the summertime, you know, a young enough bird that we can say definitively this bird was born here. So Kate, is there a chance that they're sort of staking out a breeding range that's more interior and yet it's so remote that nobody's seeing them? In, in this you know, that's what I was, that was I was originally thinking these are, these birds are known to, to be very tolerant of high altitudes and I'm thinking, well, they're just going uphill. Well, maybe you in know, Alaska range or something. Right. Yeah. But we've got, we spotted now that male at Odiak Pond in May displaying, which makes me think, well, you know, he's not going to be displaying down here. <laughs> so, yeah, isn't that interesting? So it's partnerships such as um, the partnership between bird banders and bird feeder watchers and, and hummingbird lovers and organizations such as the Western Hummingbird Par Partnership create this avenue for information exchange and for sharing and for, for learning and growing our knowledge. So this uh, summer, I had the honor of meeting Dr. Sarahi Contreras Martinez from the University of Guadalajara. She came up um, as part of the Western Hummingbird Partnership with uh, Forest Service uh, personnel, uh, Dr. Cheryl Carruthers, who also is involved with the um, Western Hummingbird Partnership. Dr. Sarah, he runs the farthest southernmost banding stations for hummingbirds and rufous hummingbirds in particular. And she's very concerned uh, with migration. Uh, and she had never been to Alaska before, so it was a great honor to, bring, to get to meet her and um, show her the farthest northern banding stations in the world for rufous hummingbirds. So that's, uh, I got. She actually came in the worst possible time, too. She came right at um, the time when the birds were all nesting, and there was all this bloob and bug around, so there was hardly any birds coming to the feeders at all. But I managed to pull off one bird for her. We caught one bird. It was great. So we weren't completely stunned. So she's tracking hummingbird migration, and we're hoping to share data between um, our two sites and do some, some papers on site fidelity and uh, this migration. Uh, uh, interesting puzzle that we're looking at. So is she banding near Guadalajara? She has several really remote banding sites way up in, in the mountains, and I don't know exactly where they are. But not on Baja. Do you know pizza? Or do you, do you know I think it's in Guadalajara. Vitsa is, uh, Vitsa Cabrera is a, our U.S. Forest Service intern. She's our um, intern for Environment of the Americas? No. No, they're national programs. It's a national program? It's international. International program, okay. So this is a, a hummingbird festival in 2016 that I went to in Sedona. And these types of events are really great, not only because it gives us an opportunity um, a bunch of us banders get together to work these uh, migration sites like Sedona, 
uh, it gives us a chance to pool our resources, learn from each other, and catch a lot of birds, but also gives us an invaluable opportunity to engage with the public and to not only give our knowledge to the public, but also to learn a lot from them as well, sightings that, that, that they have and what might be going on in their little worlds of hummingbirds. So thank you very much for coming. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Is there a certain area that you would love to catch a, a hummingbird from? Like, oh, you mean like in, ta in, in Cordova? Or yeah, like find one, like if you were ever to find a, an already you know, banded bird, is there one that you really <laughs> <laughs> well, the bird we always want is the, the bird that was banded elsewhere, you know, that's always the great one. But what I really want to do is find a rufous nest. Yeah, um, there, there has not been a rufous nest described in South Central Alaska, to my knowledge. Not described. A couple people claim to have seen them. Bruce Campbell says he had one in his yard years ago, uh, but they're so elusive, generally. What about Bill Calder's work from Arizona? Yeah, oh, there's there. lots of nests. Yeah, there's lots of descriptions of nests in California and Arizona and down there. But this, this was in Juneau. Oh, well, I'll have to look and it up. And fiberglass insulation. <laughs> <laughs> the nests yeah. on our walls. And, and he also worked out here five and a half mile, but I'm not sure if he worked with nesting birds or what. I'm pretty sure he did. Okay. So I've had reports um, like. Uh, um, uh, um, Perkins's, the Perkins uh, that just left, mm -hmm. our mechanics. Yeah. Uh -huh. Lene said that she had a nest um, that she could see outside her kitchen window, and they had a big tall house, and her kitchen window was like above on the second floor. And it was a big tall 200 foot spruce across from her window, and she said that she had spotted one there in years past, and I asked her to let me know if she saw one this year, and, and she never um, notified me. But it's things like that. So if you find a nest, let me know. <laughs> But I, I would love to catch a bird that perhaps um, was banded by somebody in Canada or on the East Coast, uh, you know, farther north than, than Florida. That would really give us some amazing information. But rufuses are known to be wanderers. They show up at weird times, especially in the fall. Young males just, they wander, and you find them in the weirdest places. But the number of hours of time that we spent banding in Shiniga Bay, was it more in comparison to what you're able to do now that you have a full-time job? Right. Um, because when I lived in Chenega, I was self-employed, I could set up my traps in the house, and I could be working from my computer, and then be advantageously catching birds throughout the day, which was great, but it didn't track real well for recording effort. So now I'm trying to be very, um, much more scientific about my approach. So when I go and I set up traps to catch, I'm doing an hour sections at a time. So whether there's birds showing up or not, that trap is gonna be open for an hour. You know, and then if there's a lot of birds, I might go for another hour. So I can track my time and effort a lot better, which, which translates to better, better statistical science. So, but um, since when I first moved here and started banding in 2016, I wasn't working for the Forest Service and I was self-employed. And um, so 2017, I became, I started working that season here. And so I'm banding mostly in mornings, evenings, and on weekends. But now I'm in a great apartment where I can do a little bit more of advantageous banding. So, um, uh, yeah, effort, I would say it's about equal at this point. Because I'm a lot more smarter about how, how and when I'm catching birds so that my effort isn't wasted. Whereas I think I spent a lot of wasted time in Shiniga looking at empty traps. Yeah. Um, remind me, and I could maybe give you this guy's name or ask the question, but a, uh, a friend of mine who did owl research in Montana, I'd swear he had a, a, some sort of miniature light he could put on birds to locate out like solid owl nests. I don't know if that would translate to the size of a hummingbird. I mean, solids yeah. are pretty small, but they're still gigantic compared to a hummingbird. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> but anyway, we, we could ask that question yeah. if there's anything like that that would help you, like if you uh, 
we're able to put it on a female during breeding season, able right. to track it at dusk or something. So the technology is getting there. I, I'm guessing less than 10 years. I'm thinking right around five. So they've got, you've, most everybody's heard of pit tags. These are really short, short, small, um, uh, period. Um, Coated wire. Yeah, so they're, they're, you, put, you put a tag on a creature and every time it passes a marker, that marker pings, right? So they use them for like bees fish. Um, and fish and, uh, and other things. So I can imagine getting something small enough to put on the band pretty soon and where we'll be able to set up little like markers throughout a territory and then when that bird flies past, it'll, it'll trigger it. And it should be able to tell us individuals mm -hmm. as well as just an animal that was tagged has passed. And then, you know, think about what Craig Mackin does with his orca tag. So he's got a tag that puts it in that whale, and every time the whale surfaces, it sends data up into a, to a satellite, which then shoots it to his computer, and he knows how long that whale dived, what the temperature of the water was, how deep it dived, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty soon that technology is going to be small enough to put on tiny birds like that. And, uh, and we'll just have a band that'll have that microchip already embedded in it with some sort of solar receptor, and our life will be a heck of a lot more fun and easier and <laughs> we'll be able to follow the birds by computer. So, that, but we're not there yet. So, some of the questions we are looking at with, with hummingbirds are, for example, we, don't, we know how hummingbirds are important pollinators, but we don't know how important are they as pollinators and what specific species are mo most important for those hummingbirds. So right now, we're, um, myself and I, I am uh, hoping to have officially announce a new submittee who's going to help me out with the hummingbird project here soon. Uh, and she, uh, Dr. Lisa Kennedy, some of you guys may know her now, Dr. Dawkins. Uh, she just married one of our biologists here in um, the office. And she is a, a bird biologist and hopefully will be working with me and the hummingbird project. And so we're looking at starting a pollen study to, work, to analyze uh, the pollen and the, the flowers that these, these birds are visiting. We also are very concerned about pollution. Neonectide uh, insecticides are a huge, huge issue right now with birds. And there were several papers that were published in the last couple of years that talk about how hummingbirds are actually picking up these insecticides in the nectar and potentially the insects that they're eating as well and how it's affecting them in many, many ways. Physiology, it's messing up their directional sense. It's messing them up um, physically uh, and causing issues that we don't e aren't even clearly understood yet. So these are just some of the questions that we're asking as well as just basic questions. Where are they going? How are they going there? And why? Yes. Now, have you heard of any reliable sightings of ruby throats in Fairbanks? No. I keep on asking for a picture, but they don't send them to me. I get those uh, at least once a year. I get a, uh, uh, somebody say, oh, yeah, there's a bird in Nome, or there's a bird in Fairbanks, or whatever. And I'm like, send me a picture. Yes, Kate. Are all the um, tags the same colors? Like, if you took a picture of one, you, you wouldn't know anything about it, like where it come from? Or Each band has a unique letter and uh, and series, but number series. That. It's not like there are different colors. Really. Not for not for hummingbirds. Yeah. Now, we do uh, we bird avian researchers do use color tags. They're usually a vis visual marker. So, for example, I worked on a research project in Arizona on western bluebirds. We were doing nest box studies on um, on uh, it was actually on on. Uh, parental fidelity, sexual fidelity to partners with each other. It was actually a very interesting study. But so each bird was marked with his federal band, that silver band with the numbers on it. And then they also had three color bands, two on one leg and one that sat above the federal band. And by using, looking at, visually looking at those birds and those color combinations, we could identify the bird without having to capture it and look at those numbers. And I'd have to walk those box, that box line every morning. It was like 200 boxes. And I swear some of those birds got so used to the fact that I was coming to the box and I would not leave until I identified them that they would jump out onto the exposed perch and go, okay, you got it? Are you sure? I right, go now. Right? I know they figured that out. So, 
Yeah, so it's really, really hard to see those bands, especially on hummingbirds, because they fly with their landing gear up and the, the feathers cover their legs. Uh, so you can't see them when they're flying. And unless they're like coming in like this to the perch and you're focused perfectly, you're just not going to see that band, much less be able to read all the numbers. Yeah, Bill. Do you have any suggestions on how to make your feeder or feeders more attractive to the birds? Like Keep it clean about and a lot. Um, out of the wind and within a short distance of shelter. We like to dive in from a bush or a tree mm -hmm. and come in. So, but the more feeders you hang and the more flowers you have, the more birds you have. Um, yeah, so Dan Logan, you know, I'm living just down the street from him now, and, and he comes in, he's like, you know, Kate, are you seeing any birds? Sue says there's no more birds on her feeder. What's going on? And I'm like, because they're all on mine now. Because <laughs> I have like five feeders up and all these hanging flower baskets. And they're like, hey, this is where the buffet is. Yeah. So I said, bring Sue down. She can come. <laughs> so, so yeah, keep your feeders clean. Even if it looks good, change the water at least once a week. If it's hot and it starts looking kind of opaque, change it more frequently. Black mold, no black mold. Just scrub it out good with soap and water. Maybe use a little hydrogen peroxide or OxyClean if you need to. Rinse it really well. Maybe get an extra rinse with vinegar and water. Make sure, you know, smell it. Make sure you don't smell any of that vinegar left and you're good to go. One part sugar to four parts water. So one cup of sugar to four cups of water. Just dissolve it. You don't even re really need to boil it, just, just so the sugar dissolves. And then whatever you don't use, keep it in the refrigerator. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. So if you see, yes? Is there, um, like the interior lodges up in the mountains of Alaska that feeders that see hummingbirds? The that farthest north that I get reliable Rufus reports on are at the um, the Alaska Wild Animal Park there in Bear Valley, which is just about outside of Whittier. What's, the, what's that place called? Where they got Portage. The, Portage. Yeah, Portage. But what's that wildlife park, that little... Um, Portage Wildlife Park. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Center. Yeah, they ha they've been hanging feeders there for over 20 years. And they've got tons of Rufuses every year. I've been trying to work out something that um, to go and band over there. But basically, rufuses are going to stick to that spruce, hemlock, blueberry, salmonberry, riper riparian area. So they'll come right up that corridor, up through Bear, Bear Valley. But once you get a little bit farther north from Portage, it, the, the topography completely changes. And they don't have that same wet riparian spruce hemlock area. And so you, you're not going to see them very often up there at all. Any other questions? Thanks, Kate. Thank you for coming. Let me know when you see hummingbirds.